Hello, I'm Dr. Harold Koenig, and welcome everyone to our monthly seminar on spirituality um, and health. Today we have the uh, man, <laughs> the spirituality and mental health man of the of all time here. It's Ken Pargament. I'm so thrilled to have him speak today to us. He is Professor Emeritus of Psychology at Bowling Green State University. He's authored The Psychology of Religion and Coping and Spiritually Integrated Psychotherapy. Dr. Pargmet is editor-in-chief of the two-volume APA Handbook of Psychology, Religion, and Spirituality. With Julie Eckstein, he has authored the recently released Working with Spiritual Struggles in Psychotherapy from Research to Practice. This, this is a book that, that they just released. He was Distinguished Scholar at the Institute for Spirituality and Health at Texas Medical Center. His awards include the Oscar Fisser Award from the American Psychiatric Association in 2009, the first outstanding contribution to the Applied Psychology of Religion and Spirituality Award from APA in 2017, and get this, honorary doctor of letters from Pepperdine University and recently named one of the 50 most influential living psychologists. So we are privileged to have Ken talk to us today. I've, I've known Ken for somewhere around 30 to 35 years. We've been, we've done research together. Ken is the is the best mentor of truly of all time. His students are, have populated universities throughout the world that he has been the primary mentor for. So, um, you know, it, probably uh, probably a quarter of the people in spirituality and health are his students. <laughs> so it's amazing. Anyway, Ken, I'll stop blabbering here and have you take it over. Thank you very much, Harold. Let me put on my share screen here. Okay. Oh, good, that works. That's always a relief. Well, uh, thank you, Harold. And it's a pleasure to see you again. And uh, one of the wonderful parts of working in this field is the, the people involved in this research generally tend to be really great people, wonderful people. And Harold is at the top of that list. I've really enjoyed collaborating with him and having friendship with him over all of these years. So thank you, Harold. Um, and I need to thank the John Templeton Foundation for their support of portions of this research that I'll be describing. And I want to um, thank Julie Xline, who's been my partner in research on uh, spiritual struggles, the topic today, uh, and the co-author of uh, our recently released book. This will be my only plug today. Um, that's a uh, that's the the cover, and that um, the bowl there, the ceramic, is actually a piece of kintsugi art, which I'll describe a little bit later on because it is a, a a wonderful metaphor for work with spiritual struggles. Um, uh, though I'm an academic psychologist, I've spent uh, one day a week over the years uh, doing clinical work. I keep my fingers in, in practice. And I'd like to start with a brief story of a client I worked with many years ago now that helped trigger my interest in spiritual struggles. And I'll call him George. Um, when I met him in the waiting room of my office, uh, he looked like a man who had been uh, gone through little hell. He was bent, haggard, red-rimmed eyes that stared off in the distance. And he kept repeating in the waiting room, my brother Joe is dead. My brother Joe is dead. Um, I asked him to follow me into my office. And there he sat for the first few minutes, just repeating, my brother Joe is dead, as if as if the, the reality of this death was something he couldn't swallow. It was caught in his throat. 
I learned that within the last um, three years, George had lost his brother, Joe, someone he had been very close to, both of his parents to different diseases, and his two adult sons, one to a degenerative neuromuscular disorder and one to cancer. Um, on the way to the funeral of his brother, Joe, his sister had suffered a stroke that left her paralyzed on half of her body. Um, George had been the primary caretaker for both of his sons and his parents when, as they were dying, and he had watched them all die terrible deaths. Um, these weren't George's first experiences of loss. Um, as a, he was a 58-year-old African-American man who looked quite a bit older. This is just a picture that reminds me of George, not the real picture. Um, he'd grown up surrounded by poverty and crime and was drafted into the army and went to Vietnam where he served in a combat unit. Um, he relayed the story of um, his unit taking a break, drawing straws to see who would get the water for the unit. Um, he lost, he drew the short straw and went to a nearby stream. And when he was at the stream filling the water, water canisters, uh, his unit was hit by mortars and all of his uh, friends in the unit were killed. Now, in spite of all of these trials, uh, George had been sustained by his faith for much of his life. Um, he was a deacon in the AME church. His father was a minister uh, and his sons and, and were also active in the church. Um, Joe was also a deacon in the church. When I asked him whether he had spoken to uh, the minister of his church um, about everything he'd been through, he gave a bitter laugh. Um, he had spoken to the minister and the minister said, well, surely you must have done something um, uh, to um, step out of God's good graces. And George was very embittered by that. He said, he was blaming me for all those deaths and he calls himself a man of God. I asked George what was the most painful part of his experiences, and he answered with one word, why? Why had God put him through this hell? Why had God singled him out for this misery? He saw other men in his community, same age as his sons, and these others were involved in crime, gangs, drugs, and they were healthy and alive. And why hadn't God taken them? His brother Joe, George said, was the best man he'd ever known, a man who touched everyone with love. Why had God taken Joe? Who was this God? How could he ever pray to this God again? If this was who God was, George said, this was no God he could ever love. And if this was God, then George hated him. Uh, George had been traumatized in virtually every way imaginable, psychologically, socially, spiritually, but what he had perceived as the greatest trauma was spiritual. How did it make sense of George? Well, clearly he was met the criteria for post-traumatic stress disorder, but PTSD didn't do full justice to his experience. On top of everything else, George was going through spiritual struggles. Now, oftentimes in our work with uh, people facing illness, uh, accident, injury, or other crises, we overlook the religious and spiritual impact of their trauma. But there are times when it's the religious and spiritual conflicts, tensions, questions, and doubts that may be the most important issues raised by critical life events. And I'd, I'd say this was certainly the case with George. Um, and in this talk, I'd like to suggest that we can't really fully understand or help people through their darkest times if we ignore the spiritual dimension of these crises and their problems. So I'm going to make a few points briefly uh, this afternoon. Spiritual struggles are a natural part of life. They're not pathological. They have profound implications for health and well-being. We can think of them as a fork in the road. They can lead to decline and possibly lead to growth. They represent a topic 
that's vital for, for us researchers and practitioners. I hope to at least be somewhat persuasive on all these points and leave then a few minutes at the end for any questions or comments you may have. And I'll illustrate these with both clinical examples and, and research studies. Um, let me begin with a, a brief definition um, and note before I do that religion and spirituality as, as Harold has documented in his um, landmark books, they're generally successful in helping people find significance in life. They're also generally quite resilient to most extreme life situations. People preserve and protect what they hold sacred. But even though spirituality is quite resilient, there are times when we can be shaken to our core. These are times when we call into question our understanding of the sacred itself. And the ground that we stand on is no longer stable or steady. And then we may experience spiritual struggles of the kind encountered by George. So here's a definition. Spiritual struggles refer to experiences of tension, strain, and conflict about sacred matters with the supernatural, within oneself and with others. We can uh, broadly distinguish between three types of spiritual struggle, um, but you'll see that Julie Eckstein and I have made finer distinctions in our, our measure of spiritual struggles. And I'll present some of the items in just a minute. We can think of supernatural struggles. For instance, there are struggles with God as illustrated in Psalms and Jesus Christ on the cross. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? It's a, it's a very powerful struggle, well known in the Judeo-Christian world. Um, a more recent example, in my own class, I was giving a lecture on spiritual struggles, and afterwards I received this email from an undergraduate with bipolar illness. And she wrote to me, I'm suffering, really suffering. My illness is tearing me down, and I'm angry at God for not rescuing me. I mean, really setting me free from mental bondage. I've been dealing with these issues for 10 years now, and I'm only 24. I don't know why he keeps lifting me up just to let me come crashing down again. These are some divine struggles from our religious and spiritual struggle scale, a six factor scale. Um, felt as though God let me down, anger at God, feeling abandoned by God, feeling punished by God. We can also think of demonic struggles, struggles with evil forces or a demonic figure. And these are some items, feeling tormented by the devil or evil spirits, feeling attacked by the devil or evil spirits, feeling you're in a, 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 a wrestling match with the devil or evil spirits who's trying to turn you away from good. We can also think of intrapersonal struggles. These are struggles within oneself, and they may be struggles of a moral character. They may be struggles about doubts about the fundamental truths of one's tradition. They may doubt doubts about the ultimate meaning of life. Here's an example. Um, comes from the diary of Peter Moen. Peter Moen was a uh, Norwegian uh, journalist in World War II in Oslo who was uh, writing for the resistance when the Nazis took over. Uh, he was captured by the Nazis and thrown into a cell where he was tortured to give up the names of his uh, colleagues, uh, all the other resistance fighters. And under torture, he eventually succumbed. And in the jail cell, using a thumbtack and toilet paper, he wrote a diary of his feelings. He hid the diary under, the, under a grate in the cell. And even though he was killed later, being transferred to a concentration camp, um, he had told someone about the diary and they went and rediscovered it after the war. And the diary really is a classic example of moral struggles. Uh, here's one example. He writes, I must recognize with bitter and painful regret how inexpressibly badly I've lived. I've reduced to dust all moral and material values. All this following his failure to um, keep quiet under torture. <clears throat> Here are some moral struggle items wrestling with attempts to follow moral principles, 
uh, feeling torn between what one wants and what's morally right, and so on. Then we have ultimate meaning struggles, struggles about whether life really matters, feeling as though life may have no deeper meaning, questioning whether one's life really makes a difference in the world. And we have doubt items again, feeling confused about religious and spiritual beliefs, troubled by doubts or questions about religion, wondering whether one's beliefs are, are correct. And finally, we have interpersonal spiritual struggles. So these are tensions and strains that take place between uh, the individual and family, friends, or members of a religious community. Um, I found that much of George's bitterness was, uh, and, and struggle and depression was linked to his sense of uh, abandonment and betrayal by his clergy and other members in his church. Here are some interpersonal struggle items. Feeling hurt, mistreated, or offended by religious and spiritual people. Um, feeling rejected by religious or spiritual people. Um, conflicts with other people about religious or spiritual matters. That item could be endorsed by an atheist. Uh, feeling angry at organized religion. Also someone who doesn't have to be religious to experience that type of struggle. So with that in mind, this kind of overview of the types of struggle we've identified, and we don't think we've identified all of them, but we think these are some of the, the, the important ones that we, we started with. Um, some basic points about struggle. They're not a sign of weak faith. Um, I have, this is my guess the struggler sign uh, slide. Take a look. And uh, some of you may recognize who this struggler is, um, is Mother Teresa. And she certainly was able to maintain her commitment and uh, spiritual vocation throughout her work, but she also had periods of deep struggle. Uh, if you read her biography, uh, it, she suffered with feeling of, uh, kind of spiritual abandonment, spiritual dryness, as um, others have called it. Here's some other, um, uh, uh, and spiritual struggles aren't uncommon. Some famous people have struggled spiritually. Um, St. Augustine, uh, Galileo, uh, Darwin, um, Dostoevsky, no, that's Tolstoy, and um, George Harrison. Uh, I noticed they all are men and they all have beards. And I don't know if that increases the risk for struggle. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, em empirical studies show that well, that Julie Eckstein and, uh, and I and her group have done, 70% of people report struggles at some point in their lives, a third to a half report struggles in the last few weeks, and struggles are uh, prevalent among every religious group, uh, including atheists who uh, report struggles, particularly around uh, interpersonal struggles and struggles of ultimate meaning. All demographic groups struggle. Uh, adolescents tend to show higher levels of struggle than the other age groups, but there's no demographic group that we found that doesn't struggle. So they seem to be pretty much of a, a universal experience. Uh, uh, just as another example, a study by Winkleman um, in, at Harvard's medical school with 69 advanced cancer patients, 58% um, endorsed a spiritual struggle. Uh, these are largely divine struggles, feeling abandoned by God, angry at God, and punished by God. Um, I don't have time to get into the, the kind of uh, developmental precursors to struggle, but um, struggles do grow out of uh, an interplay between personal, social, and situational factors. Uh, just to say a little more about the situational side, uh, struggles grow out of illness, a time of struggle. COVID has elicited struggle among many people in the world today. Natural disasters trigger struggles. Transgressions feeling you've failed to live up to your, your moral values and your, your higher values, or experiencing the transgressions of others, 
Um, this overlaps with the moral uh, injury events, uh, way of thinking about moral injury events. Um, climate change. I mean, struggles can be tied to major um, macro environmental events. War. War and migration, we're learning that those experiences also are tied to, uh, to struggle. Now, we try to emphasize that um, as, as um, that these struggles are a natural part of life. People also struggle at different developmental phases. Uh, there's nothing pathological about them, um, but they are certainly painful and can, they have the potential to create major problems. Okay, it doesn't have to happen, but they have that potential. For instance, here's an example of a uh, description of a struggle by a Roman Catholic uh, nun who had been, uh, the dream of her life had been to uh, become a writer. And she was accepted into the Iowa State Writers Program for a summer, which is a really great program. And she's all excited about going. And then her order told her she couldn't go without giving her any rationale at the last minute. And she experienced this spiritual struggle. And she wrote a book about it called um, Scarred by Struggle, Transformed by Hope. This is how she described her pain. I'd find myself swimming in a sea of black, my arms and legs heavy and lifeless, tears in my eyes. The frustration of it all swept over me like waves on the beach, pulling me under washing me away from a farm emotional shore. Day after day, the real the struggle raged. Struggle is never done without cost. Real struggle marks us for life. So clearly we have a woman who's in terrible pain in the midst of her struggle. Now, empirical studies have linked spiritual struggles to a variety of indicators of mental health and health. Um, and let me just, um, there are literally now um, dozens, even hundreds of studies that are now using uh, measures of spiritual struggle that, that help us make this point. In one study by uh, my former great grad student, Hasham Abu Raya, um, studied a national sample in the United States representative, and all types of struggle were tied to greater depression, greater anxiety, less life satisfaction and less happiness. And that's after for controlling for religious commitment, neuroticism and social isolation. Uh, another example, a study by Joe Courier studied veterans from Afga Afghanistan and Iraq and they completed comprehensive measures of suicidality and higher levels of struggle were strongly tied to suicidality and in including the likelihood of future attempts. Um, and interesting that of all the predictors of suicidality in this study, only spiritual struggles emerged as a significant predictor. Um, and I, I have to mention one of the first studies in this area that I did with my colleague and friend, Harold. We did this now, geez, Harold, and that over it's like two decades ago, <laughs> um, where we followed uh, almost 600 hospitalized patients over the age of 55 uh, in North Carolina and uh, at baseline and then a two-year follow-up. These are patients hospitalized with various medical illnesses. And over that time, unfortunately, 176 died. We were interested in how religious coping at baseline uh, might predict their adjustment two years later. And what did we find? Well, we found that uh, spiritual struggles with the divine, what we used to call negative religious coping, predicted increases in depression, declines in uh, physical functional status, and declines in quality of life after all kinds of controls were entered into the equation. And maybe even more striking was that the struggles with the divine predicted about a, oh, a one-fifth to a one-third greater um, risk of mortality again, after a number of controls were entered in. So these struggles with the divine, some of them, and I'll show you the specific items, predicted greater risk of dying, wondering whether God had abandoned you at baseline. 
questioning God's love for you at baseline, deciding the devil made this happen at baseline, all predicted increased likelihood of dying over the next couple of years. Um, this was the first study of its kind to show that at least some types of religious experience might actually increase threats to uh, life expectancy. We all know that uh, religious involvement, namely church attendance, can um, extend life expectancy dramatically among uh, whites and even more dramatically among African Americans. But here we're seeing struggle increasing the risk of, of dying. And other studies since have shown struggles have been tied to various indicators of uh, immune functioning uh, and declines in immune functioning among people with illness. And that may begin to shed some light on how struggles may produce their uh, deleterious effects. Um, one other study I wanna mention, cause I think it is important, particularly nowadays with our focus on um, major life stressors. Uh, we did this study a few years ago now, Julie Pomerlo, again, a nationally representative sample and found that religious struggles mediate the relationship between stressful life events and subsequent adjustment. Um, we think it's an important finding because, you know, we know that stressful life events have, uh, have negative implications for health and well-being, but the question is why? We know also that the link between stressful life events and adjustment isn't that high as to suggest that they always produce problems. Um, what accounts for the, the link? Well, we suggested religious struggles might. So someone exposed, for instance, to uh, a morally uh, injurious event in, in Afghanistan or um, uh, Iraq, uh, whether they experience problems might depend in part at least on whether they encounter struggles as a result of that event. And that's what we found in this study that struggles were partial mediators partially explain the links between stressful life events and subsequent problems. And all this suggests that in work with people with say PTSD, it's important to find out, are they struggling spiritually? And to pay particular attention then to their spiritual struggles if we wanna help them work through the trauma. So it seems pretty clear that struggles are tied to uh, poor, poor um, health and well-being. But is this the full story? Because um, we often think about struggles of all kinds also being a source of growth and transformation. And let me just say a little bit what I mean by growth here. And I, I'm using Tadechi's and Calhoun's understanding of it. Um, growth, we're referring to transformation. You're talking about changes in life priorities, a discovery of personal strength, finding a new life path, experiencing a new sense of closeness with others. Is there any reason to think that struggles could lead to this type of transformational growth? Well, again, it may not be strange to imagine that much of uh, psychology rests on the idea that people can turn their pain um, and problems into growth. Theorists from Jean Piaget to Eric Erickson to Sharon Parks have described how periods of stress um, and strain are precursors to growth and maturation. Uh, James Fowler has elaborated on that in his uh, faith maturity scale and, and writings. Does this apply to spiritual struggles? Um, well, maybe so. Uh, Julie Exline and I have talked a little bit about how each type of struggle may create, at least contain the potential for growth. Struggles with God may increase intimacy with God by pouring your heart out to God, positive and negative. Maybe that increases intimacy. Maybe it helps challenge old and overly simplistic ideas about God and help you move to a richer understanding and relationship with God. Moral struggles, maybe they foster soul searching as painful as they are. Maybe they point to your moral limits. Maybe they encourage repentance and reconciliation. Ultimate meaning struggles. Maybe they lead to a, 
appreciation of the emptiness of what you've been pursuing in life. And as a result, create a kind of almost a conversion like uh, shift to sources of uh, deeper uh, purpose. Doubt. Maybe doubt cultivates critical thinking. Maybe it helps clarify what we truly believe versus what we've been told to believe. So each of these struggles we think could lead to growth and transformation. Um, and certainly in the religions of the world, we find examples of religious leaders, the seminal religious figures who struggle. In fact, sometimes I think that stories of struggle of, the, of these figures are the essential narrative. I mean, just think about it, Buddha, for instance, struggled with the temptations well, before he became the Buddha, um, and he had to deal effectively with the different temptations that had been sent to him by uh, the devil Mara. Um, and we see Jesus struggling on the cross. We see Moses struggling with God and the Hebrew people. All of these are, I think, are you can't imagine the religions, I think, if you take the struggle out of it. But the struggle in these stories led to transformation. It wasn't just struggle and pain, it was struggle, pain, transformation. So does that happen really? Well, we can find it again in some narratives. Uh, Joan Chittister, she ultimately finds her life transformed through her struggle. She writes, struggles give life depth and vision, insight and understanding. And here's the sentence I like, it not only transforms us, it makes us transforming as well. So struggles have implications, not just for our own selves individually, they change our relationship with other people in the world. They make us transforming. Well, we can find plenty of case studies, narrative accounts. What do the empirical data show? Well, they don't show a consistent connection between struggles and growth. You find some showing a link, others showing no relationship and others showing that struggles lead to decline. So it's certainly not a consistent picture. And the bottom line we feel is don't sentimentalize spiritual struggles. Don't assume that if you're struggling, you're going to grow. It doesn't seem to be inevitable. And many people struggle and decline. And that's very clear. And yet then, Oh, and, and, and so let me, one other interesting study here, I'm just throwing this in because we recently published it that I find so interesting. Maybe we oversimplify all of this when we say struggles lead to growth or decline. Maybe they lead to pain and gain. Um, and we did a study with a, a, a data set, uh, Richard Cowden and, and uh, his colleagues did a study with uh, um, South Africans who reported an interpersonal, transgre interpersonal transgression. And they had two waves of data over six months. And they report that spiritual struggles at baseline predicted, not surprisingly, increases in depression. More surprisingly, they predicted increases in post-traumatic growth. So with the same data set, we found struggles leading to both pain and gain. So maybe that's a part of this, that yeah, they're tied to pain and growth, you can't disconnect the growth from the pain and the struggle. You need to have both, but this is all very speculative at this point. Right now, we think it's useful to think of struggles as a fork in the road. They can lead to growth or decline, uh, and maybe sometimes both. Then a key question is what determines the trajectory? And I'm just going to briefly note a few factors here that may determine the trajectory. This is all pretty new research, but I think they're important to note. Acceptance of the struggle. <laughs> we found that people who struggle, who try to suppress it or avoid it, seem to run into more problems. The study by uh, Carmen Omig finds that among people with high levels of spiritual struggle, those who try to avoid it or suppress it experience more anxiety. Those who don't try to uh, avoid it or suppress it have lower levels of anxiety. <clears throat> this fits nicely with what R.D. Lang wrote in 64. He said, 
There's a great deal of pain in life, and perhaps the only pain in life that can be avoided is the pain that comes from trying to avoid pain. <laughs> I think that's really a good one. Um, a second factor that may determine the trajectory of struggles, and I'm just going to mention this briefly in the interest of time. Um, can you find support for the struggle? Do you have people you can talk to? You have people who can support you in the process rather than stigmatize you or threaten you or tell you you're weak of faith. There's some data to support that. I'm going to skip that for now. Can you find a resolution to the struggle? It looks like it makes a difference whether the struggle becomes chronic or something you can work through. And again, a study by Harold Koenig and I, we found that among strugglers, uh, this is that medically ill sample, over the two points in time of our measurement, chronic strugglers, those who struggled at baseline and at follow-up, they were the ones who were most likely to experience declines in their health over the two-year period. So as one chaplain explained the, these findings to me, he said, oh yeah, that makes sense. They got stuck in their struggle. Right, right. yeah, they got stuck. And part of, <coughs> excuse me, part of hospital chaplaincy is about helping identify strugglers and then spend some special time with them. And I think that would apply to uh, therapy as well. Just a few practical implications for you. <clears throat> First of all, what not to do. When you hear someone struggling, don't change the subject. They're important to talk about. Don't assume you understand because you need to learn more about that. We need to take kind of an attitude of humility to learning about struggles. Um, don't judge. Now, who are we to judge someone in their struggles? We need to learn more about them and try to avoid easy answers. We're trying to solve, we're trying to solve these problems quickly. I mean, we're talking about wrestling with the, the most profound existential and spiritual issues and take two aspirin and call me in the morning is not the solution to spiritual struggles. Ask about them. Well, a great question I found to ask even in the first session with someone is, so tell me, have your problems affected you religiously or spiritually? We often ask, how have your problems affected you socially, emotionally, physically? Well, how are they affecting you religiously or spiritually? And this question can open the door to a conversation about spiritual struggles. And of course, be on the lookout for chronic strugglers. Listen to and normalize struggles. <clears throat> I think the most helpful thing I was able to do with George was to just listen to his story. Uh, he didn't want my theological advice and uh, he didn't need it. He was much more theologically sophisticated as a deacon of the church than I was. And as a Jewish guy, I couldn't comment on his theology and I had no business doing that. That was way out of bounds. But he appreciated my listening and my empathy and my uh, support of him. It's also, I think, important to normalize struggles. Uh, many people, when they struggle, feel as though they're going crazy. They feel very isolated and alone or very fearful that they'll be rejected by other people, their religious community, or even God. And so to, norm to be able to say, hey, you know, a lot of people struggle. You're not alone uh, can be one of the most important gifts that we give to people who are struggling. Um, there's a metaphor that I've used around struggle that I, I find very helpful and, and my clients over the years have also found it helpful. It's, and it comes from the, the Japanese ceramic art form. It's got basic philosophical roots and uh, I think it's called wabi-sabi. Um, and it's kintsugi art. Now kintsugi art, oops, involves taking a piece of ceramic and shattering it. You then put it back together again with gold or silver filigree. And in doing so, it becomes very clear that it was broken. But in putting it back together again with the gold or silver filigree, it becomes a work of art. And the philosophy embedded in this is the idea that 
in our, our brokenness, we create the pieces to build a greater wholeness, a greater beauty. And that to acknowledge that brokenness is an important part of our growth. And I, here's a, from a theistic tradition, here's one person who puts it nicely. He says, the heart must break to become large. When the heart is broken, then God can put the whole universe in it. Again, the idea that there's something um, even beautiful in brokenness and then putting the pieces of our lives back together again. Um, and I've offered that to many clients who come in and feel so broken. And I suggest Kintsugi as a metaphor for what we're working to do, that we're, their, their lives become works of art that we're trying to help uh, recreate. I had one client send me a thank you note and she addressed it to Ken Sugi. <laughs> So I thought that was pretty good, Ken Sugi. In this work, we also need to build bridges with religious communities. Um, we may need to form uh, consultative, uh, collaborative relationships with, with clergy or chaplains who can help clients in on the religious dimension of reconnecting to their communities or experiencing sacraments or rituals that can help um, help them resolve some of their struggles. I've done this with clergy myself, and it's been really very helpful to clients. So this is a great opportunity for building uh, collaboration and connection with religious community spiritual struggles. Develop and evaluate interventions to address struggles. We're really just starting here, but we can develop evaluations to, uh, to test the efficacy of struggle interventions. Uh, one example that um, my graduate students and I did now a number of years ago, uh, we de developed a struggles intervention for uh, students entering college. And we know that time is a time of struggle. We know adolescence is a time of struggle, but that period of transition from moving out of the home to a college community, which often has its own challenges of greater freedom, moral kinds of questions, how am I gonna behave? What do I wanna do around matters of faith? It can be a time of struggle. So we developed this intervention and uh, that we called Winding Road. Um, Winding Road is a nine week um, group-based uh, non-denominational program. And it had several goals to uh, help to people, the students to express their spiritual struggles and normalize them, help them develop their spiritual identity, broaden their coping resources, and facilitate their acceptance of struggles as a normative experience. And uh, we made use of a number of uh, activities. First of all, they wrote and shared spiritual autobiographies great experience. I've, I've done that in all of my graduate classes to have people write and share their own stories. They shared their struggles and rather than keeping them to themselves, they opened up and they learned in the process they weren't alone. They did this experience of visualizing their ideal older spiritual self, themselves at 90 years of old age as sages. And then we had them give themselves as sages advice the sage would give to them now. And they, they were very wise, these sages. And it was very helpful to the students. We had them share a sacred object with the group. What resources do they have for their struggles? One student, I remember, shared a, an amulet she wore around her neck, which contained ashes of her father, who had died as, as, a, as a, when she was a young adolescent. And writing a group lament to God. So sharing all kinds of feelings, anger, abandonment, um, fear to God as a group. The program was quite successful. Um, significant changes, even though it's a small N, on a lot of different dimensions here. Struggles, distress, uh, behavioral, emotional control, feeling accepted by God. Here's a, one of the quotes we had that illustrates acceptance. I'm okay with the fact that I have struggles now. It's okay for me to be struggling. It's okay to not have the answer right now. It's a little scary, but that's okay. It's okay to be scared. It's okay to be confused. 
and just take my time, try to figure it out and not let anybody else pressure me about things. It's a, it's a beautiful quote. So these are only pilot programs and we need more studies that, that really focus on uh, imaginative creative ways of helping people deal with their struggles. One last practical implication, I think it would be neat to imagine ways to help people anticipate struggles before they occur. And two obvious places to do this work, one would be in churches, synagogues. Why not talk about struggles on the pulpit? Why not make it a part of religious education, particularly for adolescents? Help them anticipate struggles, the questions they're likely to experience in life. Um, we know that's an important time for uh, the direction they're going to take with their faith one way or the other. And I think many people leave their tradition when they have struggles and they don't have a place to put them. They can't make sense of them. Uh, they can't move forward with them. So why not provide some anticipatory guidance? And why leave that to religious institutions? Why not talk about it around the dinner table? Why not raise these questions and issues in family? I mean, I know it may sound a little weird and unusual, um, but I think it, these are important topics. Why not talk about them in, in families? Um, one program I know uh, by George Zorno did this program called Lamentations, um, called Crying Out to God. And he goes out to churches and has them do group laments to God. But the important thing is he goes first. He shares his struggles. And I think, wow, that's really neat. I mean, for a minister to take the risk of sharing his struggles to the group, and it normalizes it, and it helps people deal with struggles, not just when they're occurring, but to anticipate them as a natural part of life. I mean, after all, if a minister can struggle, then it's okay. I can struggle too. So let me conclude. Um, I think struggles are natural parts of life when the path is narrow, when um, seems the road is rough and life seems and the, and the journey seems to be an impassable one. Um, these are times of struggle, um, but I think they're a natural part of life. You can't go through life without struggling cognitively, socially, physically, spiritually. Um, but they are momentous. They can lead to distress, but they can also be a source of growth and transformation, sometimes both. I think of struggles as, as experiences that are often hidden in the cracks and crevices of human experiences. Uh, and that's why we may not have paid enough attention to them because they seem to be almost camouflaged. But once you get sensitive to them and you move them out of the background into the light, then we're be, we can learn more about them and then how to help people at these turning points in life. But we're only just beginning to learn and there's a lot more to learn. Uh, we don't have any easy answers and, and we should avoid them because easy answers here, I suspect will just make matters worse. Um, so I conclude that health professionals from every sphere can help clients and patients respond to struggles in ways that do lead to greater wholeness and growth. And that is our, I think that's a, a challenge for us uh, right now. So I wanted to leave a few minutes for questions or comments. Um, so why don't I stop here? Great, Ken. Thank you very much for an, an expected great presentation. I think we'll just open it up now for anyone who would like to ask a question. Um, please take advantage of this opportunity to converse with, uh, with Ken. Just unmute yourself and uh, ask your question. Yeah. This is Francis Liu in California. Thank you Hi, very Francis. much, Ken, for that beautiful, beautiful uh, talk this morning. Um, I'm just uh, wondering, are there any uh, special films, feature films that you, you feel uh, might illustrate um, spiritual struggles that have resolved in a, in a positive sort of way? Um, you know, I, 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 I have in the book, we have a list of, um, of stories and um, personal kind of narrative accounts of people who struggle 
uh, who've come through it. And so we do have a list of those types of resources there. Films, though, I, I haven't put that together again, but that's a great idea because you can yeah. see them all around and maybe we could all generate some ideas of what the films may be. Um, I, I have thought too, that it might be, in, particularly within medical context, it could be really valuable to create a film for uh, hospital patients, uh, people coming in, facing some difficult times, help them um, anticipate their struggles, offer them resources, normalize the struggles, have some other patients who would tell stories of their own struggle and journey. So I think um, using film and media for this would be a great way to go in terms of educating and helping people anticipate struggles. Thank you very much. Um, may, can I ask a question as well? Sure, go ahead. Um, so thank you so much for this talk, Dr. Pergamon. It uh, is just really touching me on many levels. I, I am a psychiatrist but, and I do try to help my patients with their spiritual struggle, struggles, but uh, I also have my own. So I think um, my question is, um, I'm trying to be articulate about it, but it's complicated in my mind. So uh, when someone has a spiritual struggle um, and you know, you talked about all the way they can grow from that struggle in finding the answers. When they find those answers, um, I'm sure there are two ways they can find the right answers and they come closer to a correct understanding of God, or they can find another way of lying to themselves that makes them feel better but it's also another false way, um, replacing the old way maybe. So we don't want people just to have the feeling of growing and feeling better. I'm, I'm thinking that we want them to get closer to uh, the right understanding of God, or at least this is what I'm hoping that my spiritual struggles do to me. However, it's not that easy because it, every single time you try, every single book you read, uh, you find the answers that that person had for their own spiritual struggle. Like I, I'll give you two examples, maybe uh, like a great book, like when bad things happen to good people. Finally, the author has some great suggestions and validation, but his conclusion is that God is not omnipotent. When he gave choice, um, he set some rules in place and therefore uh, he's not going to intervene. You cannot be upset with him when he doesn't give you what you want. Other people say prayer only changes you. Uh, it doesn't control God. So therefore, why even bother? So every single person that had a spiritual struggle found an answer that worked for them. But how do we find the right answers? How do we guide our patients towards the, uh, uh, towards the right answer? Sometimes not even clergy might, might be able to do it. In all your experience, what are the books, the experiences, the people that have guided you towards the correct way of understanding what this is, what this means in the end. Yeah, it's such an important question, but it's also a risky question too, because um, we want to help people find some resolution to their struggles. And yet to think of a correct resolution, uh, it has some risks associated with it, as if we in our role as mental health professionals can define the right answer or the correct solution. That may, that may take us beyond our boundaries, what we're able to do. I think, I think of it more as helping people, helping to people to develop a, a broader and deeper spirituality to help them uh, along the journey with support and encouragement. Um, I think the empirical literature suggests that people um, can experience struggles over multiple times across the lifespan. So it's not as if struggles once resolved are necessarily um, resolved forever. Um, for instance, we know um, there, there's some very, um, the, I'm, I'm trying to th think the, uh, there is a, a book, uh, the, the, the guy who, the guy who writes the book about um, uh, um, Elie Wiesel, he describes his spiritual struggle in the constant, oh no, Viktor Frankl, 
no, this is Elliot Weasel. He describes his spiritual struggle in the concentration camps in World War II. And he seems to be a model to people about someone who's spiritually mature and has perspective. Well, at the age of 80, he suffered uh, a heart attack. And he has a book out that describes his spiritual struggle at the age of 80 about why is God putting him through this misery? So even though he had, I think, come to terms with many of these spiritual issues earlier in his life, later in his life, he faces another spiritual struggle. So I think we should be thinking of struggle as a natural part of life that may not be a single correct answer or right solution, and that instead we try to help people find um, solutions and answers that work for them that may vary from person to person. So it's, uh, it's, we need to approach it with that kind of sensitivity and nuance. I, I don't know how well that answers your question, Camelia, but it's a really good and important one. Hello, can I come in from Bangalore, India? <clears throat> Hello. Hello. Can I come in? Dr. Murthy yes. from Bangalore, <laughs> India. Yes. yes. I want to share two things. One is that uh, in my work with persons living with cancer and caregivers of developmental disabilities, repeatedly I found that they're using spirituality as a way of coping with it. You know, whenever I asked what helped you to live with this problem, they came up with a story. And very often it is a story from one of the epics like Ramayana, Mahabharata, Gita. In addition, the three very recent saints, I know time is uh, running out, uh, Harald, I'll just uh, quickly finish. Uh, Ramana Maharshi, Paramahamsa, J. Krishnamurti all had cancer. So they said, you know, particularly Ramana Maharshi, when he's asked about pain, he says, my body has pain, I don't have pain. They use these similes, these experiences as a way of coping much better than what I thought. Let me just give you one other example. I had a young uh, middle-aged lady with uh, whose brother died of chronic renal disease because she couldn't give a, a kidney donation and she was deeply depressed, nothing helped. Then I told her in the uh, dialogue, the story of uh, Buddha and Isa Gautami, how he brings the dead body of the brother and uh, son, and uh, that helped us to open up a new way of looking at death. All the guilt and the struggle moved to a different level. So I think we have a tremendous, particularly in India, we have a tremendous lot of resources. And I'll be very happy to share. Recently, I talked uh, about uh, spirituality and mental health, an uh, underused resource in India and written recently about cancer and spirituality, my experiences, I'd be glad to communicate uh, with anyone who is interested. And I personally think in uh, Eastern countries, I know more, I worked here, this could be a very, very important resource to help people to live with uncertainties and suffering. Thank you very much. It has been a fantastic evening. Thank you very much. Um, just real quickly, I'll, I'll note that um, this talk focused on spiritual struggles, and it does it did not speak to the, the positive religious coping resources that many people draw on. Um, that was another book and research that Harold and I have done for many years. So I totally agree with your sentiments there. It's just that we shifted to a different kind of focus here, maybe somewhat of a darker side to religious and spiritual experience, and yet one that's, I think, an important one for us to be sensitive to. So they're both, I think, parts of religious life. Both the coping resources and the struggles are part of what it means to be on a spiritual journey. Hello, can I ask a question? Can I make a quick comment? I've got my hand up. I'm Sarah Eager. I'm from London, from the Spirituality Special Interest Group at the Royal College of Psychiatrists. And um, we're. I'm trying to organize a, a meeting next year on um people's relationship with god because it's something that's not discussed in the in the clinic setting very often um and and as you say it can have positive or negative ramifications so um i'd really love to get in touch with you to see if you could be um one of our speakers so if you let me know how that's possible that would be lovely thank you thank you um yeah uh, you can contact me through my email uh, just go Ken Pargament at Gmail. Thank you. Hello. Can I go ahead, Leonard. Go ahead. Um, right. 
Um, if one accepts that there's a biological component to the intensity that different individuals have of their need this, to search for spiritual meaning in life, with patients who are dealing with struggles, do you ever suggest that they are in some way a victim of their own biological reality? For example, we know that serotonin receptor intensity is, is lower in people who have strong spiritual needs and the intensity, the, the, these uh, serotonin receptors are much higher in people who have very little need for spiritual answers to life. Do you ever bring in biology to your conversation with patients? Uh, yeah, we have. In, in terms of struggle, for instance, we distinguish between primary struggles in which struggles lead to changes in physical and mental health from secondary struggles in which physical and mental factors uh, create or produce struggles. Uh, and then there are the reciprocal struggles or complex struggles where you get a chicken and the egg thing going on where both things are happening. But it's an important question because if the struggles are secondary to physical and, and uh, psychological issues, then you can address struggles in part by doing um, medical mental health treatment. And there are plenty yeah. of examples in the field, for instance, of, um, oh, I don't know, people who feel that God is angry with them and wants them to kill themselves or pluck out their eyes. Um, and, and that's a secondary spiritual struggle. And by giving them the appropriate psychotropic medications, the struggle mm -hmm. is resolved. So it's important to kind of um, I think try to unpack the, the psychological, physical, and social factors that are all embedded in spiritual struggles. Very Thank good. You. Okay, well, we're, we're uh, at the time we have to stop. Ken, you know, what a great presentation, what a great interaction to end here. And uh, I just want to thank you so much for 